From so called angels of death to some of the most prolific serial killers the United States has ever seen. Here is part 3 of the top 10 real prisoners who are too evil for hell. Starting off our list in our number 10 spot we have Vicki Dawn Jackson. Vicki was a woman who worked as a nurse for a number of years. She first got her nursing license in 1989 but it wasn't until the 2000s when things took a seriously dark turn. Between December of 2000 and February of 2001, the hospital that Vicki was working for recorded a number of deaths that was unusual. It was a higher amount. Most of these patients were in the age range of 60 to 100 years old, and of course people just chalked this up to the advanced age of most of these patients, but a rumor began to spread that someone just might be responsible. After this, the hospital's administrator noticed that a vial of a drug called Mivacron had gone missing. You might see where I'm going with this. As it turns out, the person responsible was Nurse Vicky, and she had at least 10 patients whose lives she took by giving them too much of this missing drug. It was a muscle relaxant. Taken that this is 10 people between December and February, that is an unbelievable amount of people in a remarkably short amount of time. You might be wondering why she took these lives, and apparently she did it when she found these people rude or, quote, too demanding. In our number nine spot today, we have Daniel Perez, also known as Lou Castro. Daniel led a cult that was located on a 20 acre property in a rural area just north of Wichita. He convinced his followers that he had magical powers, and he told them all that that he was a centuries old angel who needed to commit some horrific crimes in order to stay alive. These crimes would have certainly been more than enough to throw him on this list, but he of course couldn't just stop at committing one type of crime, he had to make sure he really stole the show on just being the worst. Basically he had the really clever idea to use his followers life insurance policies to live a lavish lifestyle, like as if no one would think that's weird or suspicious. While some of these life insurance policies were collected through regular means, of course that kind of greed only leads to evil things, which of course means that he ended up taking one of his followers lives so that he could collect the cash. It is thought that he also contributed to the deaths of some of the other people's life insurance policies he cashed in on, but unfortunately there was never any evidence that would be able to substantiate that claim. Despite this however, on April 21st, 2010, authorities were able to arrest Daniel and he was charged with 28 felonies. In February of 2015, he was convicted on all counts and received a sentence of 80 years in jail where he remains. In our number 8 spot today we have Chester Turner. Chester is an American serial killer who, on April 30th, 2007, was convicted of taking the lives of 11 women in the Los Angeles area, and on June 19th, 2014, he was convicted of 4 more that they were able to tie back to him. He has been referred to by prosecutors as one of the most prolific serial killers in the city's history, and if you know Los Angeles' history, that says a lot. In his original trial that led to his conviction, Chester was sentenced to death, but out of the following one in 2014, he also received an additional death sentence. In the end, like with a lot of these kinds of stories, DNA came to save the day and help authorities find out who was committing these horrible, horrible crimes. In our number 7 spot today, we have Michael Bear Carson and Susan Carson. This couple is not one that anyone would want to encounter. The stories of these two come from the 80s, they were married, and on the outside they appeared like just a couple of harmless hippies. We all know not to judge a book by its cover though. In the end, they would go on to become known as the San Francisco Witch Killers. Didn't know San Francisco had so many witches running around. Basically, together the pair took the lives of three separate people between 1981 and 1983. They started off by killing their roommate, who Susan claimed was a witch, and said that she was stealing her quote, health, power, and beauty. They next killed one guy that they worked on a farm with because they said he was a demon, and the final person they took the life of unfortunately picked up the pair as they were hitchhiking, and they took his life because they claimed that he was a quote, black witch, whatever that means. Essentially, they were just committing crimes against people that they claimed to be witches. The pair were each tried and convicted for each separate crime, and are both serving sentences of 75 years to life, and of course, neither of them have shown any kind of remorse for what they've done. In our number 6 spot today, we have Samuel Dietman. Samuel is just one half of the pair known as the serial shooters. He, along with a man named Dale, were actively committing these crimes between May of 2005 and August of 2006, and basically they were arsonists who would randomly set fire to objects, but they would also drive around and commit random acts of violence, taking people's lives. In the end, a series of tips is what led investigators to identify the perpetrators of these horrible crimes, in particular one 
from a friend of Samuel who explained that Sam had actually confessed to some of the killings one night while drinking. In Dale's trial, he was sentenced to death six times and his brother, who was later found out to have assisted in some of the crimes, was sentenced to 25 years. Samuel was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. Dale ended up taking his own life while on death row, which is why this point mainly focuses on Samuel, who remains in prison. In our number 5 spot today, we have Keith Hunter Jesperson, also known as the Happy Face Killer. After the body of his first victim was found, Keith had someone else actually claim to be responsible for his crime. You would think that this would have been his ideal scenario, but that was not the case. He wanted to be known for his crimes. So to help himself get media attention, he drew a smiley face on a bathroom wall hundreds of miles away from his crime scene, and here he left an anonymous letter where he confessed to the crime and provided proof. He didn't end up receiving a reply, so he decided to write more letters to the media and to the authorities, each signed with a smiley face. In the end, Keith was initially caught after he became the prime suspect in the death of his girlfriend at the time. Previously, his victims had been people that he had no connection to, so this was truly the mistake the authorities needed to catch him. Keith then admitted to his crimes, and while he has formally been linked to eight deaths, he has confessed to somewhere around 185. Keith was tried and sentenced to life without parole for his heinous crimes, and he remains in prison at Oregon State Penitentiary. In our number four spot today, we have Quincy Allen. Quincy Allen is a man who went on a crime spree between July and August of 2002, where he took the lives of four people. His crime spree was actually inspired while he was in prison serving time for stealing a vehicle. It was here that a fellow inmate decided to start recruiting others and told him that he could get him a job as a mafia hitman. And this is all that Quincy needed to be inspired. As soon as he was out of prison, he began practicing for his new upcoming career. Quincy started off his horrific crime spree on July 7th, 2002 by attacking a 51 year old homeless man who was sleeping at the time. Luckily, this man was able to survive this attack. His crimes continued until he was arrested on August 14th, 2002. After his arrest and trial, Quincy received a sentence of death and is still on death row awaiting execution. His sentencing did not deter him from the criminal life, however, as in 2009, Quincy, along with another inmate, planned an attack on a correctional officer at the prison they both reside at. In the end, the guards had to use rubber bullets to subdue the pair. Quincy was intended to be executed on January 8th, 2010, but there was a stay of execution that was accepted, and as of July 26th, 2022, Quincy's death sentence was overturned. In our number three spot today, we have David Berkowitz. David Berkowitz, or the son of Sam, is an American serial who terrorized New York from July of 1976 to July of 1977. He took the lives of six people and wounded seven others, all while eluding the biggest manhunt in New York City history. He was one of those really arrogant ones who leaves the like the little notes for police, promising to do it again, kind of like taunting them. Well, his arrogant self was caught for his crimes, and he was arrested on August 10th, 1977, and he was indicted. He confessed to all of his crimes and claimed that he was just obeying the orders of a demon that had manifested itself in the form of a dog that belonged to his neighbor. Okay. Sure. He was found mentally competent to stand trial, and he pleaded guilty to his crimes, which left him sentenced to six consecutive life sentences. He later admitted to making up the dog story, which we know, but he did say that instead he was a member of a violent satanic cult and his crimes were committed as a part of that. These claims were investigated, but no one has ever been able to confirm or deny these claims. In our number two spot today, we have Sean Great. Sean is a serial killer who committed a series of crimes from 2006 until he was apprehended in 2016. Throughout his decade of criminal activity, it is thought that he took the lives of at least five people. In September 2016, Sean was arrested and later indicted for two killings, as well as kidnapping and harming a woman whose 911 call actually led to his arrest. At the same time, in another county next door, he was also being charged with two other deaths, as well as another one from all the way back in 2006. This final count from all of those years ago was actually an unsolved Jane Doe case, who had been unidentified for 12 years. When Sean confessed to this crime, he wasn't even sure who she was, he just said that he believed her name was Dana. On May 7th, 2018, Sean was convicted on two of the counts, and on March 1st, 2019, he pleaded guilty to two of the others, and on September 11th, 2019, he pleaded guilty to an additional count. In the end, he was sentenced to death and has remained on death row since that final plea and sentencing, 
and he is currently scheduled to be executed in 2025. In a very bittersweet turn of events in June of 2019 that Jane Doe victim was finally able to be identified through the DNA Doe project and she was identified as 23 year old Dana Nicole Lowry from Minden, Louisiana. It definitely can't bring her back but there is a lot of comfort in knowing that her family finally received some answers. In our number one spot today we have Glenn Stewart Godwin. In 1980 Glenn was working in California and wasn't really living a life of crime so it's pretty surprising that in this year he and his roommate decided to make a plan to rob someone they knew who was once a friend of theirs. Of course things go awry and it turns into a botched robbery and Glenn ends up taking the life of the person they were robbing. They then tried to blow up the crime scene to get rid of any evidence but of course that didn't work and also just made them look even more insane. Both Glenn and his roommate were both tried and convicted for the crimes in 1983. This is not where the story ends. In 1987 Glenn tried to escape prison and failed and this landed him at a higher security prison. At this new prison he attempted escape again and this time he was actually successful. He fled to Mexico where he tried unsuccessfully to be a part of the illegal drug trade. He was arrested again and sentenced in Mexico and this is when American authorities began the process of getting him extradited. During this process Glenn decided that it would be a brilliant idea to take the life of an inmate who was a member of the Mexican drug cartel which very obviously slowed the process of extradition. This gave him time to plan another escape which he did in 1991 and since then he's been on the run. Alright guys that has been our list for today. Thank you so much for checking it out. I've been your host today Olivia Kozlowski and I'll see you again soon. Bye.